Today is part three of building the Practical Electronics Rhythm Generator. It's going to be built into a wall-mounted enclosure so people can use it at the museum. It's not going to be the only rhythm machine in the museum that is interactive, but it is based on a 1978 magazine article. If you haven't seen the last couple of videos on this, then go and check them out. And it's going to be good to get this one over and done with so we can go on to the next magazine project, whatever it may be. Ultimately, I think I'm going to put this rhythm generator just above the bouncing ball generator that I built a couple of months ago, which is right next to the remote control animatronic King Henry VIII, of course. So we've already built the drum voices. These are triggerable by pretty much anything. All you need to do is send in probably like five volts into each of the trigger inputs of them, and you'll be able to trigger the drum voices. You don't need a sequencer. You don't need anything. You can literally probably get away with triggering them with a piezo contact microphone and a drumstick even. But today we're going to try and build a sequencer for it. We're not going to use the chip that is in the magazine, the M253AA, that's because it's a preset rhythm drum machine and it's a little bit hard to find them nowadays. They're about £50 if you want to buy one of these M253AAs. So I figured let's experiment and let's make something a little bit interesting. So the first option we have is we can make it from a 4017 chip, which is quite a popular chip in sequences in like beginner synthesizers and a lot of synthesizer little sequences and you may notice that you might see sequences that count to 10, which don't really make sense. Usually nine times out of 10, that's because it's built around a 4017 and you know, this has 10 outputs. It can count to 10. So they went for this. Basically what this does is it receives a clock and then it sends out a signal. It sends out data out of each of the 10 pins that sends out. And in fact, we've built one right here. You can see on this very gnarly and gangly looking uh, thing. Ignore this top bit. This is merely just being a clock. In fact, I'm going to pull that away out of shot. So right here, we have the 4017 uh, chip. Uh, what this is doing is this yellow wire is receiving a tick, 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 tick. In fact, you can see the LOD flashing and that is flashing into this and that's sending five volts, blah, 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 blah. And that is telling this chip to jump to the next pin. And as you can see, each time it jumps, it goes to another LED and it makes this fancy Christmas decoration light, uh, which is which is not very useful. Uh, straight away but what you do actually is you use the vo the power the voltage that's going into these lights actually as voltages to talk to a synthesizer oscillator so you send this into a potentiometer uh, which you can choose how much of that voltage goes into let's say an oscillator or something like that a control voltage source so then you make a schematic like this which is pulled from the internet of a of a baby eight step sequence which has a potentiometer in each of these lights so when each of these when one of these lights turn on it goes to that potentiometer and it makes it adjustable makes this light you know voltage adjustable which means you're able to make a sequence so it'll be like the problem with the 4017 chip is it's very rigid in its functionality this is all it does it just counts over and over again and um if you reset it, because it's actually got a reset, a little reset pin as well, which makes you be able to start it over again, is it starts again at one. And in fact, the other cool thing is, before we do that, and I may as well mention this, so you can use the uh, reset pin, which is pin number 15, which is right down here. Pin number 15 is here. If I put a wire into here and plug it into any of these LEDs, the sequence will stop at that LED. So if I put this into any of the LEDs, you'll notice that less of the LEDs are lighting up. Like for instance, right now, I've accidentally just wired it into the second step. So it's just going through these two. Let's plug it into a different one. Now it's using the signal out of itself to reset itself and it makes it shorter and shorter sequences. And this is how you can get, this is how you can get an eight step sequencer because you can bring it down to reset for only eight steps, which makes it a very useful and musical sequencer. But the problem is, is it always resets to the first step. You'd never get it resetting to off. You can't turn off any of the chips and you can you can make it more useful using extra logic gates and stuff like that but i figured why not go a little bit further and have a look inside the 4017 chip so let's have a look so the 4017 chip is an integrated circuit it's an ic integrated circuit means there is a circuit within the chip 
And this is what that circuit looks like. Ooh, ooh, ooh. That's it right here. This is how it does its thing. Um, it may not make a massive amount of sense here. Uh, these are what you call flip-flops, and they're not the flip-flops that you wear on your feet. They're the flip-flops that you wear on your breadboard or your circuit or something like that. These five different flip-flops basically flip over and kind of tell each other to turn on as the other one turns off. And then in certain uh, kind of... Um, mixtures of these cause each of these steps to turn on in separate times. So what I figured we should do is we should build something similar to what's actually on the inside of the 4017 chip. However, we are going to go one step further. You see this only has uh, five flip-flops but it's got ten outputs. What we're going to do is we're actually going to build a flip-flop for each of the sequencer outputs and then we're going to use that as our sequencer because we can then inject different uh, commands and voltages and different things inside the sequencer within the 4017 chip, ultimately, possibly making it more usable. Uh, the only reason I'm doing it in this drum machine is purely because I want to and I've never done it before and I'm really interested to see what happens. What we're going to use for these flip-flops, flip-flops, flippy floppies, uh, something called the 4013 chip, uh, which is a, uh, here's a little data sheet for it, a 4013B, I'm not lying, it is called a flip-flop, a uh, dual D-type flip-flop. D means it receives a data pin. There are different types of flip-flops and that's not going to be what we are covering today, but I, there's m mountains of videos on flip-flops and stuff, so I thoroughly recommend you typing in flip-flop, what the fudge is going on on YouTube, and you'll get the answers. But we're going to see what a single flip-flop does first. Right here is a single flip-flop on this 4013 chip, wired up as a two-step sequencer in a way. It stores a bit, basically. If I push this button, which pretends to be the clock, uh, well, look, you can turn that on and off. And the other thing is, the uh, flip-flop, all flip-flops have two outputs. There's the uh, Q, it's called, and then inverted Q. And so Q, if Q is off, then all oh, inverted Q is on. Look at that. So now it's a two-step sequencer. I'll just make these a little bit further away. You can use this clock instead of the switch. Two-step sequencer. Another, another quick thing to mention is right now you're only seeing lights, but imagine these lights as potentiometers on a sequencer. Imagine these as knobs, and this will make uh, this whole video a little bit more easy to understand if you're not sure how the knobs work with this. Just imagine these as the different knobs that you're able to adjust it. Okay, so yeah, there we go, here we go, this will make sense. So I've got a drawing right here of what is going on. There's the five, feet, five volt button going into the C, this is the clock, and this can be, this is where you saw the 555 timer chip going in there as well, it was telling it to keep on doing its thing. And every time this receives a clock pulse, uh, the flip-flop listens to this D input, and this is the data input. So imagine, and this data input is actually wired straight to this uh, output, inverted Q. Uh, so this one right here is the first flashing light. This is this one right here. If I unplug this flashing light because it may, may mo make more sense. So the inverted Q output, which is where the old LED that I just pulled out from was plugged into, if this is opposite to this, every time this LED is on, this one is low. So this basically sends a low signal over to the data pin. So this sends nothing, it sends zero into the data pin. So what the data pin receives, when it sends to the clock, it actually turns this LED off. So it's like, oh, nothing's on, and then it turns this LED off. But when this LED is off, this has to be the opposite to that LED. So this LED turns on, this goes high, and this actually sends five volts back into the data pin. So when the clock goes in, well, yeah, it listens to that and it makes that go high. So this ends up making it go up and down and on and off and on and off every time you listen to the clock pulse because it's listening to itself do its thing. How cool is that? So what we need to do next is we need to wire up multiple flip-flops next to each other, listening to the same clock. But the great thing is, is when one after the other is listening to the LED, let's say this is high, but this LED is actually wired up to the input of the next flip-flop, on the next clock, this will turn off and the other one will turn on. And this is where this schema, this is where this breadboard layout comes in. 
what I've got wired up here is actually this circuit. And this is one flip-flop here, but instead of, we're ignoring these inverted cues now. So we had to take a step back because it won't work listening to these anymore. It's not gonna work. So what we need to do is we need to listen to the cue that is wired to the LED. Uh, this is also actually wired to the data input input of the next flip-flop and now that is listening to that so when this clock which is wired to both of the flip-flops when this goes in basically uh, this um, LED goes high it sends a clock and then it sends this pulse down to here and the next clock this will go high and that will go low so this goes off and then it goes around in a circle again so it does exactly the same thing as last time but we've got two flip-flops but the fundamental difference with the way of doing this is we can actually extend this so unlimited we can have an unlimited amount of flip-flops one after the other to make a sequencer so as you can see now uh, it's got the clock going in it's still just a two-step sequencer but now it is actually using this circuit with two flip-flops one after the other and this means that it's going to be able to be ultimately infinitely expandable the more flip-flops you add going after each other well the more steps you get Okay, so the problem that we have with this right here is when these two lights are off, there's not actually ever any kind of uh, bit. There's nothing high and there's no way for us to actually turn either of them on. How do we how do we tell it to turn it on? So if I send a little bit of five volts just to get this going and the clock's too quick, you best be a little bit quick or you're going to be in a problem. So you can actually do it. See, I just did it then. But if you can see there now... If I, if I hold it for too long, it gets full and you can't do anything with it. Like you say, they're constantly on. So before we can even get any more sequences and steps in here, we need to solve this problem. That is, uh, we can't actually write a bit into this without it going all kerflunk. Uh, so what we need to do is we actually need to use another flip-flop. This flip-flop right here, the first circuit that we did, which is basically the flip-flop that turns itself on and off. But it's got a little difference and what that does is basically what this is going to do is when this turns on this actually goes over to the data pin of the first chip but 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 the second the absolute nanosecond the microsecond that this writes a uh, clock into this and this led goes bright well this wire actually goes all the way over into the reset input of this and it actually turns this off so that means that you will never ever uh, have a problem of this writing into both of the leds but at the same time this will remember your write state until a clock comes in so potentially if there's no clock written in you can push this button right here and it will wait until a clock comes in until it will until it will send a bit of information into the sequencer and this is also a way of turning this into a like a weird sh uh, shift register sort of sequencer as well. It's quite funky. So now this is a register writer. If I push this button, it's going to write this. When it receives a clock, it will write it into the sequence. And also, it will not let me ever write too many bits into this. So what we're going to do now is we're going to put another 4013 here and basically do the same principle as this, but make it into a four step sequencer. If I push this button once, boom, we're able to write in a sequence. This is the start button. Imagine this is the start on your BeatStep Pro. This will do that, but this is not all that it can do. If you push the button again, you're able to write another step into here that's gonna play at the same time, meaning both of these voltages on these knobs, remember these are potentiometer knobs, will be able to add together if you're using an additional circuit afterwards. So look, so we now have eight flip-flops, one after the other, kind of, uh, cascading into each other. If I push this button, uh, you'll notice it's gonna, well, it's gonna count through all of the different flip-flops. <laughs> you'll notice right now that it's not actually repeating itself. That's because I don't have the last one wired up to the first one yet. Uh, but if I push this button more than once, we should be able to send multiple bits down the stream. Until we can send them all. Uh 
So now imagine this is a trigger input. Imagine this is a sequencer. Not just one of these bits are on at once. If you're using a voltage adder at the end of it that adds these voltages together, and let's say some of them might even be wired up to be offset to be negative, you could get quite complicated sequences. And if this was a drum sequencer, well, if you use that as a normal one and then you add an extra one in it, it adds another flare. Right, let's uh, get it going in a circle. Where's that diode? Oh. There's, this is only a very simple aspect of it. There is so much more that you can do with this. Um, this is only scratching the surface because now we have breaking it down, broken it down to the elements of uh, the fundamental elements. We will be able to hopefully at some point be able to uh, skip to certain things using a button, much like in the Arduino uh, kind of uh, keyboard sequencer. We'll be able to randomize it up. Like I said, we'll be able to add multiple steps in. Look like, like that, like that. Look, there's multiple ones going in now. After messing around a little bit more with this, I added a few more things to the circuit that uh, just made it overall a lot better. And it's got a little bit more complicated, but in essence, it's the same thing. Uh, there is debounce circuits. There's a few extra gates to uh, uh, to stop certain instances from making it not work and stuff. But you can write in a step, you can write in two steps, you can write in as many steps as you want, and you can delete them now one at a time. And being able to add and remove bits one by one into this sequence just seemed quite an interesting thing imagine this is a drum sequencer and these lights yeah again they're like switches on a drum sequencer you add one in to kind of make it a busy a more busy sequence for maybe a fill and then you can remove it after a while and it goes back to just one and it's back to the normal drum beat it might change sync a little bit but it just adds to uh, just make it a little bit more strange and stuff however this has got more complicated and it's got a little bit too complicated for the sequencer in the rhythm machine I think this is going to be for something completely different a little bit later down the line and I'm working on a project that this is going to be perfect for and um, there'll be more information on that later on probably on the Look Mum No Computer channel but there is a way of squeezing this similar concept down into a single logic chip and that is a serial to parallel shift register an 8-bit one in this instance we're going to use the 74HC595 and this basically takes serial commands like on and off on and off all on a single stream and that breaks it out into parallel 8-bit kind of set pins and this is perfect for making a sequencer and I did a lovely live stream on building this and breadboarding this just the other week just to fiddle around but we're going to jump straight to the stripboard layout and I will talk about what is going on. So this is the stripboard layout for the sequencer we're about to talk about right here and this is what we're going to put into the drum machine. It's a little bit of a cut back uh, concept of that other concept. It's basically using a, just a single logic chip which has got a, basically a bunch of flip flops in it. In essence you can see right here that the lights are flashing. You'll see them they turn on and off and on and off. This means that, that if there's two on next to each other, it doesn't act as a big kind of gate. It acts as two triggers. You need it to turn off before it gets to the next step. Or if you have two of these going to the bass drum, for instance, uh, it'll, it'll treat it as one big long gate. And that's not what you want for a drum sequencer. It hasn't got the feature of being able to only type one bit in at a time. So if you press start, you might accidentally type in a couple of extra bits. And you can add loads of bits and stuff that you want, and then you can reset it uh, and it resets. So there's a start and a stop and the start just basically writes in bits and then the stop stops it. And this is good because you can, yeah, you can you can sort of make weird loops still. You can make as many of the steps turn on at the same time as you want. It makes a little bit of a weirder sort of drum machine to the more the more traditional sort of 4017 uh, step sequencer approach. So this sort of adds like that. It basically takes and shifts that bit along the 8-bit sequence. So on the stripboard layer as a 555 chip. This is the clock chip for that. There is a knob for adjusting the speed. You can see there is an LED as well that turns on and off. And this basically sends a clock into the shift register. And then there's these buttons that tell it to write in a bit uh, whenever it receives a clock. The on and off uh, situation doesn't happen naturally. It stays on. And how that is done is this uh, transistor in the middle of the circuit this acts as a inverter. What it does is it receives the clock signal from here, which does turn on and off. And if you look at the on and off, it turns on and off at the same time as that. What it does is it inverts the clock signal and then it sends that into the pin on the shift register chip. 
And that means that it makes it output enable on and off to the clock, which means for every half of its uh, kind of cycle, uh, the LED spends time off. It's not great in this setup if you want to do have the lights on permanently, uh, you would need to put AND gates elsewhere in the circuit. But this is a bit of fun, it's not a serious drum machine, so if I was to make it for my personal synthesizer, I'd want these lights on all the time, and then this kind of trigger problem solving to be done elsewhere in the circuit. But now we've had a little look around different options for sequences and stuff for the uh, drum machine. Now we need to put this strip build layer into the drum machine and we're going to be doing that in the next video and it will be then finished. I have actually uh, already drilled a uh, enclosure for uh, the drum machine so it's see-through, it's going to bolt to the wall. We've already got the switches in it so uh, yeah what we need to do is just connect it all together and in the next video we'll have it on the wall and ready to be uh, yeah ready to be used. Well, that is the sequencer so far. There's going to be one more part to this build, which is actually finally putting it in the enclosure and getting it up on the wall and running. And then we can get onto the next magazine project. Most of this video was actually shot in real time as a live stream over on Patreon. The builder's live stream thing, it took about two hours to figure out the flip-flop circuit and things like that. And I did that as a live stream through the same camera that I was recording. So like people were watching it being recorded. So if you want to see this again, you can look back at that long form version and you you can also, you know, watch future ones and stuff. If you're interested in that, then go and check it out over the Patreon. But until next time, I'm Sam. This is the Museum of Everything Else. And yeah, have a lovely time.